you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. It's Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show. Com. Hey, we're coming here with another great podcast. We certainly appreciate you tuning in. We've got our most amazing guest here today that's going to talk about intermittent fasting, cancer, diet. We're going to talk about all this amazing stuff that can probably change your life and make you uh, feel better about yourself and maybe live longer. Uh, so we're going to get into that. If you want to watch the video version of this, you can go to youtube.com forward slash Chris Foss, hit that bell notification button so you get all the notifications of what we do. You can also refer the show to your friends, neighbors, relatives, go to thecvpn.com, see all nine podcasts, and also you can go to our new book club we're launching on patreon.com forward slash Chris Foss. We're going to talk about some of the background of the authors, the books we read, all the different uh, engagements we're having with the podcast. You kind of get like the behind the scenes sort of stuff. So uh, be sure to go to patreon.com forward slash Chris Voss and check that out today we have an amazing author this gentleman has uh, written a lot of books and also co-authored a lot of books his name is dr jason fung md he is a canadian nephrologist he's a world-leading expert on intermittent fasting and low carb especially for treating people with type 2 diabetes he's written three best-selling health books and he co-founded the intensive dietary management program Dr. Fung has his own websites at idm.health and thefastingmethod.com. And Dr. Fung graduated from the University of Toronto and completed his residency at University of California, Los Angeles. He lives and works in Toronto, Canada. Welcome, my Canuck friend, uh, Jason, to the show. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here, Chris. <laughs> I love my Canadian peoples. Uh, you, guys are, <laughs> we're, you, guys are, you guys are wonderful people up there. Just the nicest people in the world, really, mm. when it comes down to it. Well, thanks so much. I mean, I always enjoy my, my time in, in the United States, too. It can't, uh, I spent a couple of years in Los Angeles, had a great time. Yeah, yeah. I still go there all the time. I mean, it's great. Yeah, we might pull some A's out. And pull it. How's it going, eh? Um, <laughs> you know, I'm a big Rush fan. And, and uh, who, who's the other fan that I used to like? Bob and Doug McKenzie. Big fan oh, yeah. of Bob and Doug McKenzie, yeah. I'm old. What can you say? Rush so, is um, classic. We're going to be talking about your new book that you have coming out in November 10th, 2020. You guys can pre-order this book on Amazon.com or local booksellers or, uh, you know, whatever sort of venue you want to take and use to pre-order your books. This is pretty amazing. It's called The Cancer Code, A Revolutionary New Understanding of Medical Mystery in parentheses, The Wellness Code. So this should be pretty interesting. You can uh, order it November uh, for November 10th, uh, 2020 will be a release. Uh, let's talk about this book that's coming out here. Uh, uh, Jason, this is pretty uh, interesting. Oh, thanks. So the whole idea is that the disease of cancer is such a, such an important disease. It's the second, uh, sort of leading cause of death amongst Americans. And it's actually been rising very quickly. So if you look at heart disease, for example, in the sixties, it was kind of two to three times as common as cancer in terms of cause of death. And now they're actually almost, uh, the same. So in, uh, it, it's actually become a more and more, uh, important health problem as we go. And what's interesting about it is that if you look at the common sort of medical problems, we sort of know what causes them. So if you look at heart disease and strokes, for example, you have blood clots, which cause this. If you look at um, infections, for example, they're caused by bacteria or viruses or fungi. Uh, so we know what causes them. But the whole thing about cancer is that we still don't really know what is cancer. Like it's not some kind of extrinsic sort of uh, thing. It's not like a knife or a, a radiation or something coming from outside. It's actually a perversion of our own cells. And the question is, what is cancer and why does it exist and how does this happen? Because it's not rare, it's actually very, very common. And what I talk about in this book is sort of the, the different ways that we look at cancer and the paradigms, how we think about cancer, because it's actually gone, undergone a sort of radical, radical shift in the last 10 to 15 years, which is uh, sort of bringing new hope to cancer uh, victims. So if you look 
at sort of what, what is cancer? If you just ask what is cancer, uh, people uh, have changed their minds over time. So initially, of course, the first uh, sort of modern theory of cancer was basically it's a cell that grows too much. So if you have a lung cancer or a breast cancer or whatever, it's basically a cell, a breast cell or a liver cell or a lung cell or whatever you have, and it just keeps growing and growing and growing. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, it breaks off, it starts going to other areas, and it starts growing and growing and growing. So that's what I sort of call the first great paradigm of cancer, because it's like it's a cell that grows too much. So therefore, the, if you think about treatments, then if it grows too much, then kill it. That's basically what we got. <laughs> So we have surgery, we have radiation, and we have chemotherapy. And chemotherapy is essentially a selective poison. That is, it kills cells and it kills cancer cells slightly faster than it kills normal cells. That's what it is. It's a selective poison. But what you're doing is essentially the same. These are all ways of uh, non-discriminately sort of killing cells. So you're cutting, you're burning, and you're poisoning. And that's not to minimize the sort of advance that happened in the 40s and 50s, because prior to that, there was no real treatment. But once you started to start to uh, tailor these chemotherapy regimens and surgery and so on, you started to see, uh, you know, it, it, you know with these huge advances in cancer treatment. Uh, so certain pediatric cancers, for example, they, they, they really improved their, uh, their survival rates by a huge amount. And they still form the sort of basis of what we think of as modern cancer treatment. But it doesn't answer the question because if the question is what is cancer, you say oh, it's a cell that grows too much. So the, so the natural next question is why? Like why is it growing too much? And that we didn't have an answer. So you know, as we went through the 60s and the 70s, we started to learn more and more about genetics and the whole genetic revolution. And we looked at the causes of cancer because people say, oh, what causes cancer? People, a lot of people say, we don't know. And that's actually not true. We know a lot about what causes cancer, and these are called carcinogens. So things that cause cancer are carcinogens. So tobacco smoke, soot, for example, asbestos, radiation, certain types of medication. These are all things that cause cancer. So we have a huge list of these things. But the question is, what is it that ties them all together? So the whole idea is that if you uh, think about the genetics of, uh, of what is happening, all of these different carcinogens, they're linked because they cause genetic mutations. So this was the big sort of advance through the 60s and the 70s, is that this cancer is actually a disease of genetic mutation. And this is the theory that I learned in medical school in the 90s and so on. So that is the reason this breast cancer cell or this colorectal cell is actually changing and turning into this sort of nonstop growth machine is that it, it has some kind of mutation in the growth genes. That sort of makes sense. So we, we, we started to develop these uh, treatments that were amazing for the time. So these were genetically based treatments. So you had certain diseases like uh, CML, which is a type of leukemia and breast cancer. There was Herceptin, for example. And these were amazing treatments that really improved uh, the, the, the mortality of these diseases. So by the 2000s, we were talking about curing cancer again. So we, we, had, we had gone through, we had thought, okay, well, this is great. All we need to do is find the one or two or three or four genetic mutations that cause cancer. And then we will target this mutation and we'll be able to cure cancer. And so in support of that, there was a huge project, if you remember the 2000s, called the Human Genome uh, Project, which was to map out the entire genetic sequence of a human being as a huge deal at the time. And the thought was that, hey, if we can lay bare this, this, this whole blueprint of the human genes, we'll, we'll know where to go and we'll be able to cure cancer, no problem. Um, well, it sort of came and went, and the whole the promise of this genetically based precision targeted personalized treatment sort of fizzled. Uh, by the 2000s, there was great hope. By you know, by the 2010s, it was clear that things were not going the way we thought they were going. So, other than these first couple of uh, hits, we never we never really got to it. 
And so they did another huge mega project called the Cancer Genome Atlas, which, you know, sequenced thousands of cancers. And uh, what they found was sort of um, tough to reconcile. And that is what we found was not two or three or four genetic mutations that you could now devise a drug. At last count, there was something like 10 million different mutations. It was a huge Was that from the Biden? Number. I know that during Obama and Biden, they'd, they'd done some sort of thing where they were, they were yeah. trying to get all the doctors on one page and collect the data into a centralized source. Was that from that? That was, well, this was through, through the Cancer Genome Atlas and, okay. and, and through all the research in the 90s and 2000s. So by the time uh, they, they had Joe Biden's cancer moonshot, they were talking about trying to get this precision personalized treatment. But the problem was, of course, if you have three or four mutations, you can get yeah. three or four drugs. If you have 10 million mutations, yeah, that's, <laughs> you're not going to do that's it. That's crazy. And the problem was each cancer, some of these cancers had like, so one, one specific person would have you know, 15 mutations. Well, you can't wow. give them 15 drugs. But the problem was the very, the, 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 the next person in line would have 15 completely different mutations. Oh, wow. So those drugs were useless. So it was really, really hard. And that's one of the reasons that cancer treatment just sort of fizzled um, because we couldn't do it. This whole idea that you could just find the mutation, target it like a laser bomb sort of thing and go in and poof, take it out. Uh, it, it didn't work at all. So that sent us right back to the drawing board on that. Because again, if you say, okay, well, cancer is a disease of genetic mutations that cause excessive growth. Well, you're still left with the question, what is causing these genetic mutations? And that was the sort of big, um, big next step, if you will. And initially that they thought it was just a random mutation, but it turns out these mutations are actually not random at all. Because if you think about how cancer develops, two people with uh, very similar appearing breast cancers, for example, you know, uh, a, a woman from the twenties and a woman, uh, you know, from, from the last century, they will have almost some identical appearing cancers, but they're living at completely different times. And wow. if they all mutated, how did how come they look so similar and that was the sort of next step and that's what sort of led us to the next uh hurdle which is that what is causing these mutations and really only one force in the biological universe can produce this sort of uh you know coordinate all these genetic mutations for one specific purpose which is evolution so these cancers were not sort of these genetic freaks uh, they were actually specifically evolving towards a cancer. It's an evolutionary disease, which is a huge, huge breakthrough. So we're trying to evolve, basically? No, it's the cancer is trying to evolve. And the question oh. is, what is it trying to, that breast, so you take a lung cancer cell, right? Why did that lung, can, lung cell, this is originally a normal cell. Why does it go and become this sort of autonomous uh, cell that is trying to grow and will eventually kill you, right? Yeah. Because it's like, okay, this, this came from your own cell. <clears throat> this came from your own self, but if it kills you, the cancer dies too. So what's yeah. the purpose and why does it develop this way? So this is the really interesting part of the story is that what we've discovered is that the, 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 the cancer is actually not evolving forward, if you will, it's actually evolving backwards to a more primitive state, which is what we've always described cancers as, a primitive or de-differentiated, which is less different from each other. Yeah. And it's, it's actually moving backwards in time towards a unicellular type organism. And you have to back up a little and say, okay, what's happening here? And this, this is what took you know, a lot of people a lot of years to get their minds around. If you think about how life evolved on Earth, we actually started as unicellular organisms. So if you think about a bacteria, there's one single cell. And basically, it has to do everything by itself. So it has to get its own food. It has to do everything, right? And, and that's just like if you're to be on your own in the woods, like a survivalist in the woods. You have to do everything yourself. You have to hunt. You have to wash your clothes. You have to do everything. You have to wash your own dishes. 
as you become more and more, uh, you know, together, there are certain advantages. So from a single cell, you started to evolve multicellular organisms where cells would actually band together. And that gives you a big advantage of specialization. That is, as, you know, let's take the example of the survivalist in the woods. As you go into a city, for example, now you have bakers and you have, you know, traffic policemen and you have firemen and you have, you know, all these specialized things that do their one job better than the other. So uh, same thing with a cell. As you go towards a multicellular organism, you have specialized cells. So you have a lung cell, which is specialized for breathing, and you have a liver cell, which is specialized for detoxification, and you have skin cells, which are specialized for this. But the, the, the whole sort of prime, prime directive of that cell has now changed. When you are a unicellular organism, your primary directive, your prime directive is to survive and to reproduce. That's it. There's nothing else. If you are in a multicellular organism, everything is sort of organized for you. There are rules. You can't go anywhere. You have to stay in your place. Everybody depends on each other. So there are lots of rules, just like in a city, right? You can't just walk into somebody's house. You can't just, you know, throw your trash onto the street. There's lots of rules, but because you're able to become bigger, you actually dominate your environment. So same thing happened with multicellular organisms like humans. We have liver cells and lung cells and pancreas cells, but each cell now has to not compete with each other, but they actually have to cooperate. So what happened is that this sort of competitive uh, kernel of survivalist genes, they were never erased because that's not what evolution does. Instead, what happens is that sort of this overlying playbook gets written on top. So you suppress this old how to compete playbook mm. and you have a how to cooperate with each other playbook. Just like a survivalist is like, okay, you don't need to know how to shoot each other. You need to know how to be a good neighbor and you need to know how to wear pants kind of thing, right? So this whole, uh, but, but that survivalist playbook never actually got erased. Mm -hmm. So when you have a lung cell, which is exposed to chronic damage, like with smoking, for example, what happens is that it, it, some cells get killed off and some cells survive but it's put under severe stress. So in that extreme stress, it, will either, it faces sort of an existential crisis. That is, it either has to choose to go back to the survivalist playbook or it will die. So most will just die and you'll never see it. But mm. some of these cells will turn back into the sort of survivalist mentality. So instead of learning, instead of uh, expressing those genes, which are trying to cooperate with other genes. It now turns into this survivalist, which is now trying to survive at all odds, because that's the only way it can survive when faced with this sort of chronic damage. And that's really, uh, that's really why any type of chronic damage to the cell actually can cause cancer. And that's why every single cell in the body can become cancerous, because there's hundreds of different types of cancer. Like there's cancers of the eyes and cancers of the skin and cancers, everything you can think of can become a cancer. But not just that, the cancer exists in every multicellular organism in existence. Mm -hmm. That is, it doesn't exist in just humans. So if you're just look at human physiology, you're not gonna understand what the origin of cancer is. Because dogs get cancer, cats get cancers, rats get cancer. Even hydra, which is one of the most primitive organisms that people study in like high school biology, they get cancer as well. So it's yeah. because it actually exists. It actually predates everything. And that's why that sort of kernel of cancer exists in all of our cells. Every single cell in our body can become cancer. You know, you can have cancer of the placenta and you can have cancer of everything. And that's why, because it's actually a remnant of our own Pass. It's sort of like if you were to have a dancing bear, for example. So you, you take a bear and you train it to dance and wear a tutu, right? So that's fine. And as long as it's, it's, you, you feed it and stuff, it's fine. But when it gets mad, it goes back to being a bear, right? It stops <laughs> dancing, but it still has the tutu on, right? That's what happens in cancer. When you subject it to this extreme stress, it forgets how to cooperate 
and starts to survive at all odds. So it's like a survivalist. And I, I liken it in the book to like if in a city, for example, people don't steal or kill each other. But as soon as the law and order breaks down, everybody is all of a sudden, you either kill or be killed. It's the law of the jungle, right? Urge. Yeah. So then what happens? Well, you get lawlessness, you get looting, you get stuff that people would never do, but they're forced to because that's the survivalist training in all of us, right? And that's mm -hmm. what's happening in the cell. It's been exposed to the stress. And that's why, um, you know, it, it explains so much about what cancer is, how it develops. And now we can actually apply the entire field of evolutionary biology to say, hey, we can now bring new approaches to this cancer problem because we're not trying to treat it as if it's a genetic problem. It's not. It's actually a problem of these sort of radical anarchist cells that have hmm. tried to, trying to survive at the expense of everybody else. So what do you need to do? You need to wipe them out. And you do that by things like immunotherapy where you enhance your own immune system to try and wipe out these things. That's amazing, dude. You just blew my mind. I, I, we talked pre-show about my dog that had cancer. And so, you know, I tried to read up as much as I could being a layman and, and not a professional like you are in the medical industry, but I know everything now. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not one of those people. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, and yeah, to me, to my understanding, you know, from just, you know, what I read, obviously I don't read your book yet. Um, you know, it was, it was a cell that went malignant that, you know, somehow got damaged or whatever, and just turns into like the evil cell that goes, ah. <laughs> uh, but no, what you say makes sense. I'm, I'm an atheist and I believe in evolution. Um, so yeah, crawling up out of the primordial soup and becoming what we became and, and you just look at the science of how we're built. I mean, it's, it's still weird to sit around and go, I'm a bunch of cells. Eh? <laughs> um, but no, that, that actually really makes sense. I mean, that really does because I, I, you mentioned this as, as you're going through it, but I, I often wonder the same thing. You're like, why is there cancer? Because it will kill you. And when it kills you, it dies too. So like, it's like, it's like this suicidal sort of mission cell organism, whatever, that doesn't really make any sense, but I don't know, it's evil and whatever. But from what you're saying, that makes complete more sense. It, it basically goes rogue and, and stuff like that. Yeah. So you, you, you think about the treatments of cancer even, so things that we do, so chemotherapy, for example, is a selective poison. Almost all of them are actually carcinogens because yeah. they damage cells. Mm -hmm. uh, same with radiation. So if you look at, uh, you treat somebody with radiation for their cancer, they're at much higher risk of developing a secondary malignancy. That is a cancer down the line because you've subjected that tissue to chronic damage. So it, it's, wow. it's interesting that the actual treatments of cancer are actually carcinogens themselves but once you sort of understand this sort of paradigm you can understand okay that's that's you know that's the reason and and then you have to actually think about cancer not as a sort of genetic freak mutation this is the thing that's very interesting is that we could we had considered that cancer was this sort of um you know freak genetic mistake sort of thing that's the way that we looked at it in the 60s and 70s oh you had a mutation it was a mistake and it just grew up it's like it's no mistake like cancer survives better than anything else it's no mistake that it survives the the worst poison you can throw at it it survives as much surgery as you can throw at it wow. and as much radiation that's no mistake right we thought it was some stupid crazy thing but it's like crazy like the joker right it's actually a survival because that is the genes that have been activated are the survivalist genes that are inherent in every single cell. And that's why, uh, you know, you, you look at all the carcinogens that we talk about. So, you know, not just the radiation and stuff, but tobacco smoke, it chronically damages the lung. The asbestos chronically damages the lung in a specific part. And it's that part of the lung that is damaged that is at risk of, uh, uh, of disease or, or, or viruses, for example. So hepatitis B virus, hepatitis C virus, um, in cervical cancer, it's a human papilloma virus. When it exposes the, the liver to certain viruses, it's going to cause, again, this sort of existential threat, this chronic sublethal damage, which is sort of like taking away the law and order of that 
you know, that thing and forces those cells to become survivalist. So the cells are not inherently bad, just like a survivalist is not inherently bad. There are different rules that apply in the jungle as opposed to living in New York City sort of thing. Yeah. Different rules that apply. And when you go back and when these cells sort of turn back from a, you know, a New York City businessman into a survivalist, they sort of can't exist in this multicellular world or at least we're at odds with them. So therefore we have to try and, you know, uh, get rid of them in that way. And when you think of that, it, it's no accident that cancer actually has much more in common with an infection than any other disease. Because if you look at it, you know, uh, cancers sort of develop treatment resistance, which is that when you treat something, um, it, it, it can, you know, over time, it will resist it. So you treat it with, uh, if you treat a bacteria with antibiotics, it eventually develops resistance. Same yeah. thing with cancer. When you treat it with chemotherapy, it eventually develops resistance. Whereas wow. other diseases don't do that, right? So if you treat a kidney stone, it doesn't suddenly develop resistance to your <laughs> ultrasound, right? We it doesn't do that. Because this is actually an organism that is living, that is evolving through time and space, right? So this disease, which... Um, you know, if you have a cancer and then five years later it recurs, it has changed in that five years. So you can check the genetics. There's been there's huge differences between mm. that, the, the the genetic profile of that cancer five years ago to what it is because it's changed and it, so it changes over time. And if it if a breast cancer goes to the liver, you can check those two cancers: the breast cancer that's in the breast and the breast cancer that's in the liver. They're distinct. They're different from one another. Hmm. Because they've undergone evolutionary change. Because as the breast cancer has gone to the liver, it's had to develop, it's had to evolve the ability to live in the liver because it can't do that at the beginning. Hmm. And only evolution can do that. That explains so much, man. That logically makes sense. I mean, it, it really does. Um, you know, and, and, you know, I've had friends that have beaten cancer, but the doctors always tell them, look, this sucker is going to come back. And that explains why it comes back even more powerful than, than the first time when they beat it. Um, so you mentioned immunotherapy. Um, I, is, is that a best way to reinforce your cells or? Well, it's, it's, just... it's a new way. So uh, there's, there's obviously a lot of new ways to, to, once you have a new paradigm of cancer, then mm -hmm. you can sort of bring all these new weapons in and say, well, look, Right now, you have pro-cancer sort of effects, which is the chronic damage, which is, and you have anti-cancer, uh, you know, defenses because your body has actually evolved a number of defenses against the dark arts sort of thing. And the reason it's done that is because cancer has been with us from the very beginning since we were sort of became multicellular organisms. So there's actually a number of ways that our body has evolved to prevent cancer from taking a hold. That is, they're essentially rules to keep you as a team. Like, you know, mm -hmm. if you think about a football team, you want to all work on the same page as, as opposed to like 10 different players. Oh, this player wants to run this way and this guy wants to throw this way. And, you know, so, so we have rules to make us a team, whereas the cancer is sort of individual. So once you, once you develop, once you understand that there's these sort of answer cancer defenses, so there's things like apoptosis and autophagy, uh, I'll get back to those in a second. And then the immune system is actually primed to destroy cancer cells on site. So if you think about the immune system, the immune system is essentially this, uh, you know, this, all these cells. And it's very important for them to distinguish between our own cells in foreign cells because foreign cells you want to destroy and you want to avoid the friendly fire you don't want to sort of kill all your own normal cells so um, cancer cells are actually recognized intrinsically without ever having seen them we have a sort of natural killer cells which are primed to destroy cancer cells on site if we, even if you've never seen them so the, so the body actually recognizes the cancer as something completely foreign so that's one of the anti-cancer defenses and if we can excuse me, if we can boost that up, then we can actually tip the scales in favor of it. The other thing that's very interesting is that if we think of cancer sort of as a separate organism, then you can say, well, what are the factors that are going to make it want to grow? So what are the growth factors that are going to favor cancerous growth? Because this is going to be important because if you have, you know, uh, a lot of growth factors in your body, then 
you're going to favor high growth, which is going to favor cancer. So this is uh, where sort of uh, obesity and fasting and insulin sort of come into the play because uh, so I did medical school in the 1990s and uh, nobody recognized that obesity was actually a huge risk factor for cancer. So in 2003, there was a huge study of cancer and what they discovered was that it turns out that it's a huge risk factor. So now if you look at uh, obesity, it's well recognized that the, there's a, at least 13 types of cancer which are obesity related. So breast cancer, colorectal cancer being the most prominent one. Um, so these are really important cancers. They're, they're like the number two and three cancer killers overall. Lung cancer is number one, but that's mostly related to smoking. And the question is, what is it about obesity um, that allows these cancer seeds to grow? Because that's important, because that's something that we can actually control. Like if it's just in our genes, we can't necessarily control that. And it turns out that our body uses uh, certain things called nutrient sensors. So we sense when food is coming in and insulin is one of these nutrient sensors. So when you eat food and assuming that you eat a variety of, you know, carbohydrates and fats and proteins, your insulin will go up and that's a signal that food is available, right? So you eat food is available. Turns out that that is actually also the exact same signal for cells to grow because you want cells to grow when food is available. If you don't have food available, you actually don't want your cells to grow because you're going to die. I feel right? like I'm in an internal garden right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what happens is that if you have a disease where your sort of insulin levels are always high, that is you're eating foods, for example, that are very high in insulin, uh, you know, refined carbohydrates, if you're eating uh, all the time, because every time you eat, insulin goes up. If you eat six times a day, insulin is going to go up six times a day. If you eat mm -hmm. once a day, it's only going to go up once a day. Um, so the point is that insulin is actually not only a nutrient sensor, that is, it goes up whenever you eat nutrients, but it's actually a very, very potent growth factor. Mm -hmm. So if you tip the scales in favor of growth, what you're going to get is cancer. So what's interesting is that there are sort of rare genetic mutants, these dwarves in Ecuador, who actually don't have any insulin growth factor. They have no insulin -like growth factor. They're virtually immune to cancer. They hmm. actually can't grow. And what we see is that in, if you look at um, you know, native populations, uh, mm -hmm. people like the Inuit in the far north or the Native Americans before they switched their diets and so on, their rates of cancer were almost zero, which is fantastic because yeah. you know if you look at in the 50s the uh, there's a university queen's university in canada which would actually send researchers up to you know the arctic circle to see why these people were immune to cancer and it's like they couldn't find cancer anywhere and it's because they were eating natural foods they're eating a lot of fat and protein very little carbohydrates and they were you know they they they, they didn't activate those nutrient sensors so therefore their growth signaling was very low which tipped the scales in favor of uh, no growth, which means that cancer was firstly, uh, you know, non-existent, which is good news because again, if you can understand that, then you can say, well, how am I going to change my diet in order to minimize these growth factors in order to minimize my risk of cancer? Because cancer can, you know, for the very same person, the risk of cancer depends highly on how much growth signaling you get because it's a, it's, it's a separate organism. So you give it growth, uh, you gotta, you're going to get more cancer. So that's where intermittent fasting comes in because, of course, intermittent fasting is a great way to lower insulin. It lowers another nutrient sensor called mTOR. So if you don't have growth signaling, you're going to favor the development of – you're going to favor um, – the shedding of these extra cells, which is uh, apoptosis and autophagy, which is sort of getting rid of these other cells. And it puts you into the sort of cell maintenance mode as opposed to a cell growth mode so that you're actually uh, taking care of your cells. So that's one way that you can sort of use these sort of new understandings to say, okay, well, this is, this is great. So what you have to do is try and, try and achieve a normal weight, try to avoid type 2 diabetes, 
intermittent fasting is one of the ways, one of the tools that we can use. There's other ones, but uh, that's a good tool to use to do that. That's pretty amazing. So it's mTOR, M, the lowercase T-O-R? Yeah, so that's another uh, growth sensor. So when you eat protein, mTOR tends to go up. So Mm -hmm. if you eat beef, for example, your sugar won't go up, your insulin won't go up a lot, but your mTOR will go up. And again, it's a nutrient sensor. It tells the body that nutrients are available, puts you into cell growth mode, right? And then it's like growth is good for cancer as opposed to cell maintenance mode. So when you turn down all of these nutrient sensors, your body actively tries to get rid of extra cells. It's, it's, it's like if you, you know, if you have too many cells and no food coming in, you're going to die. So your body is just not that stupid. So it starts getting rid of these extra cells, not just the, the body fat, but actual cells. It's going to slough off. And when you slough yeah. them off, they can't become cancer. Yeah. Uh, and it's an, it's an interesting thought because it's uh, one of these things that, uh, you know, what always blows my mind is that a lot of these sort of ancient wellness traditions, you know, involve fasting. So you look at any major religion, they talk about cleanses and detoxifications. You're getting rid of all these toxins. Turns out you probably were because you're putting your, 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 yourself through a stress uh, where you're not eating food and your body's going to get rid of all these extraneous cells. And by getting rid of all these extraneous cells, you're going to reduce your risk of cancer. Hmm. That would make sense. Uh, we should probably plug your other books too, the, the Diabetes Code and the Obesity Code. And then you've written some books on intermittent fasting. and I don't want to get off your new book. Um, but I figured I'd just plug that so people, if they want to research your intermittent fasting uh, data and some of the other things with Obesity Code and, and the Diabetes Code, they can as well. Um, this is really interesting to me, uh, what you're doing. I had an experience where I, I started intermittent fasting. I didn't really do it to do it. Um, but I'd, I'd, I'd reached 350 pounds, and I, I'd gotten completely just sick of being overweight. I felt like shit. I felt like I was just at the verge of a heart attack. Um, <clears throat> and I finally just broke. I was drinking like 10 to 15 Mountain Dews a day, uh, lots of vodka, uh, just <laughs> living, just, just yeah, viva la vida, baby, going out to eat all the time. And I just hit a wall one day, and I went vegan. I quit the Mountain Dew. I switched from Mountain Dew because I still needed I still needed motivation. Uh, so I went to coffee, and uh, uh, and then I went vegan, and I started eating just vegan foods, and I got rid of meat out of my diet for uh, quite a while. And I started losing three to four pounds a day. Like I literally wake up every morning and then I started intermittent fasting. Uh, my morning breakfast would be a coffee and then I would kind of try I would hold out as long as I could throughout the day and I would, I would eat either like a small lunch. I try and do like broccoli. I mean, I, I, I went from having eggs and, and uh, bacon to broccoli for breakfast, you know, have a salad in the morning. And then, um, and then usually I'd have one kind of big meal but it was still vegan based. Uh, and uh, I did really good with it. I was losing three to four pounds a day. Like I'd wake up, like people were hating yeah, me, like uh, women were hating me online. But I, you know, I had to keep telling people, look, I was drinking 10 to 15 Mountain Dews a day. I mean, there's, there's a lot to yeah, lose there, man. There's a lot, <laughs> you know, like most women just can't go be vegans, lose three to four, or guys can lose three to four pounds well, a day. The interesting thing about intermittent fasting and fasting in general is that it's actually been around for thousands of years. So that is every major religion in the world has periods of fasting. So during Lent for Catholicism or during Ramadan or during Yom Kippur or whatever. So it's actually a practice that's been around for thousands of years. And all of a sudden it gets this bad rap in the last sort of 20 years of, oh, you should never do it. It's like, but literally billions of people around the world have been doing it. And the point is, and I had, you know, I started using intermittent fasting in my patients about six years ago. And I'll tell you, when I started talking about it, like everybody thought I was completely nuts, right? They thought I had completely gone off the deep end. But the thing is that when I had looked at the physiology of what happens to the body when you fast, there's nothing bad about it because what you're doing is you're actually using your body fat for precisely the reason that you carry body fat, right? Mm -hmm. So there's nothing wrong with it. Like if you store body fat, then you have hundreds of thousands of calories for you to use. So why should you not use that, 
right? And there's actually no reason. And people came up with all these things, oh, you're going to get hungry and you're going to get this and you're going to get that. And there's all these uh, interesting uh, things that in, if you look at hunger, for example, the hunger actually does not keep going up. So you can do you know, long fast. And the secret is that hunger is like a wave. So after you don't eat breakfast, it just actually just settles down. So if you skip lunch, for example, you're hungry at one o'clock, but if you don't eat by three o'clock, you'll actually be the same level of hunger as if you had eaten. And the reason is that if you don't eat, your body actually takes those calories out of your body fat because you've essentially fed yourself on your body fat so you're no longer hungry. When you're doing multiple day fasts, it's like even more interesting because the hunger tends to go down day by day by day. So when you do a you know, two-day fast, hunger is the most. When you get to five days, people are like, oh, I'm not hungry at all. The hunger has completely disappeared because your body is now fueling yourself almost purely on your body fat, but it's okay because that's what it's supposed to do. So it's really interesting. And then people say, oh, well, you're going to go into starvation mode. And it's like, well, that's not what happens either. If you look at the metabolic <laughs> rate, so this is what they're talking about. So if you, go, if you don't eat, your body will start, uh, you know, will not burn as many calories and therefore you'll eventually uh, gain weight again. And it's like, that's not what happens when you uh, don't eat. So insulin goes down, but other hormones go up. So your body actually ramps up its metabolism. It simply switches its fuel source from food to stored food, which is your body fat, but it actually increases. So the studies looking at four days of fasting find that on day zero, they measure your metabolic rate. The fourth day of having nothing to eat, your body's actually burning 10% more calories than at the beginning. So your mm. body is actually ramping itself up and people say, well, why is that? Well, it's because, think about it. If you're a caveman and it's winter and there's no food and you haven't eaten for a couple of days and you have no energy, you're gonna die because it's gonna be even harder to find food. So your body's not that stupid. It simply switches the fuel source from food to body fat and then ramps you up. So you actually get more energy so you can go out and hunt that woolly mammoth. So it's, it's actually really interesting. People actually, when, when and we've treated thousands of people, they come back and they say, I have so much energy. It's like, yeah, because you've actually allowed yourself to tap into your body fat stores. When you're eating all the time, you can't use your body fat because remember your body only exist in either the fed state where you're storing calories or the fasted state where you're burning calories. So if you're in the fed state, you're eating all the time, you actually can't burn your body fat. Those source, that source of calories is completely closed off to you. By fasting, you're allowing your body to now use that source of energy. And all of a sudden your body's like, whoa, I have so much energy. It's like, I can keep out and going. And something like, oh, people say, oh, you can't concentrate. It's like, well, did you know that your level of concentration and your mental abilities actually goes up significantly when you fast? It's like, think about it this way. The last time you had a huge meal at Thanksgiving, did you feel really mentally sharp afterwards? Or <laughs> did you really want to sit down and watch some football? Oh, right? Take a nap. Yeah, exactly. So your body, again, is not that stupid. If you haven't eaten for a while, your body wants you to have all your mental facilities with you so you can go out and get some food. What? So you, you go out and you say, which is more dangerous, facing a lion that just ate or the hungry wolf? Because that hungry wolf is not like lethargic and ready to fall down. That sure. thing is ready to kill you. Thing, right? thing's anything to eat. <laughs> And this is one of the things that we worked with, uh, you know, we worked with some mixed martial artists. So I worked with uh, Georges Saint-Pierre, the mixed martial artist. And he said he loved it. When he used to fast, he felt like everything was in slow motion and mm -hmm. he could just fight and fight and fight. And he, he felt like he had this huge edge. It's like, yeah. And I said to him, because you're the hungry wolf and the other guy's the lion that just ate. Like you're going to kill him. Right. So, mm -hmm. and sure enough, that's what happened. So yeah. there's all these sort of myths about fasting that it's not good for you, that it's, you know, the worst thing you can do. It's actually, if you are overweight, then that's probably one of the best things you can do for your body. There's all these changes that happen in the body, which are beneficial. Mm -hmm. You know, that was one of the things I explored when I went through this phase of intermittent fasting and, and uh, veganism and stuff. I started looking at paradigms of belief systems. You know, I, I'd grown up as a child where, you know, my parents and they're, they're good people, but, you know, my parents were like, food was a reward. So I, I always had this like, you know, I'd go to the store and I'd be shopping and I'd be like, 
I should get a bucket of, uh, you know, liquor strips to reward myself for going to the store and I don't know, just <laughs> eat, you know, just stupid stuff like that. And then I started looking at fast food and what was in the quality of food and everything else. And at the same time, I was going through with my dog with cancer and, and I was establishing and reading about how uh, high sugar diets, uh, cancer loves sugar, uh, evidently. And then uh, high fat helps the body helps the body fight it, but you I mean not high fat like I am, but the high fat of, of the of oh, what you're putting fat. in thing. And so I started literally looking at what was going into there, and you know I I'd been programmed too, like a lot of people have had with the you know that old seventies diamond paradigm of you got to eat lots of cheese, um, and then the 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 three meals a day thing. I got away from that. I, 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 I realized the belief system. I'm like, who the hell came up with this three meals a day? And I started reading about it. And I'm like, oh, the guys who make food came up with this. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, like I, I used to live that life where I'd be like, I better eat some before I go to bed because I don't want to starve. And I remember yeah. once I switched over this new thing where I was losing a lot of weight and I really should go back to it. Um, I probably will after this. Um, is, is, uh, I would be like, no, screw it. You can go back hungry. You're going to be fine. And I'd yeah. push through those things. And sometimes I'd just keep drinking coffee. Like coffee was the thing that got me through all of it. Yeah. And we tell people to use coffee or yeah. tea because, you know, if you're used to eating something, you don't want to eat something. So just have some coffee by the time. Yeah. You, and this is good for breakfast or lunch. You just, by the time you finish it, the hunger will have passed. And if you're busy, you just keep on going with your day. And one of the great things I got was a uh, was this really nice uh, reverse osmosis water machine that we reviewed on the Chris Voss show, and that made a huge difference because having just quality tasting water that that yeah. pff, that was big. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, and 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 you know the whole point is that if you look at the three meals a day, if you go back to the '70s, because this is a time before the obesity epidemic, people are eating sort of at 8 a.m. breakfast and 6 p.m. Uh, dinner. And so you don't eat after 6 p.m. till 8 p.m. That's a 14-hour fasting period every single day without even thinking about it, right? And it's like, wow, that's the, really the word breakfast. It's a meal that breaks your fast. So even in the English language, it sort of acknowledges that fasting is really a part of everyday life. You feed and then you fast. When you feed, you take in energy, when you fast, you use that energy that you took in, right? Because that's the reason you don't die in your sleep every single night, because we have the ability to store that energy and then bring it back out. But if you keep putting energy in, like a one-way valve, and never using it, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to gain weight. And mm -hmm. so in the 70s, people are eating, you know, they're eating white bread and all this other stuff, three meals a day, but no snacks, mm -hmm. right? So if you wanted an after-school snack, your mom said no. You're going to ruin your dinner. And if you wanted a bedtime snack, your mom said, no, you should have ate more at dinner, right? And if you were a naughty boy and you got sent to your, uh, to your room without dinner, you went from 12 till 8. You had a 20-hour fast. And guess I what? I must nobody have a lot died. of fast when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like nobody died. There's no bad consequences. And now you look and people are eating all the time. But we're teaching our kids, right? You go to school, mid-morning snack. So breakfast, mid-morning snack, lunch after school snack, dinner, uh, snack, you know, when you're having, playing soccer. It's like, that's six times a day. And we tell people that that's what you're supposed to do. It's like, that's what you're not supposed to do. You're not supposed to eat all the time. You're supposed to feed and then you're supposed to fast. Because when I was a kid and I went out to play soccer, I didn't need somebody chasing me with some cookies, right? I didn't need to eat it, right? It wasn't necessary and it wasn't healthy. But now we, we, we pretend that it is Absolutely necessary. The other, like a few years ago, uh, the school sent back a thing and said, oh, you know, uh, you know, uh, we're going on a field trip. Please send two snacks with your son. I'm like, why? <laughs> Didn't they eat lunch, right? Aren't they going to eat dinner? <laughs> I know. It's like, come on. You know, you can go more than two hours without putting a muffin in your mouth. Like, it's okay, yeah. right? So that's the message that I was trying to get through. It's like your body knows how to handle this stuff without like, you know, we're not so fragile that we have to sort of keep lo looking and putting a muffin in our mouth every two hours. If we did, we would have died like, you know, 2000 years ago, right? So now if you want to lose weight, all you have to do is to increase the amount of time that you're using those calories. And it's okay. 
your body will be able to handle it. It's just a matter of getting around it. And that's what our program is, the fastingmethod.com is a program to really help people with fasting, be part of a group and, you know, get some support and all that sort of stuff. What was that website again? It's the fastingmethod.com. The fastingmethod.com. I'm going to pull the, yeah. this up here. And so it's, I got can like, uh, it's, it's got like uh, programs like, uh, you know, there's a group fast and there's videos and there's courses and there's uh, forums and, you know, there's an app that you can use to track and you can track all your health uh, helpers and you can do fasting circles. So you can get a bunch of friends together and do fast all together and help mm -hmm. each other out. Right. So it's just making it, bringing it back into the uh, sort of mainstream that, Hey, if we have an obesity epidemic, which is going to increase your risk of heart disease, type two diabetes and cancer, right? There's nothing scarier than cancer. And if you are overweight or type two diabetic, your risk is much higher then you can do something about it, right? And mm -hmm. it's not, you know, it, it, it's apart from the diet. It's not about what you're eating. It's about when you're eating it. And you can use this, this, this treatment paradigm of fasting, which is free, right? It's simple. It's, mm -hmm. It doesn't complicate your life. It simplifies your life. It doesn't cost money. It saves money. It doesn't take time. It saves you time, right? And it's available literally to anybody right now. Like you can do it right now. I'm not trying to make money off of you. You're not trying to make money. It's available to everybody. And it's been used for thousands of years successfully. Like what more do you want from, yeah. uh, you know, a treatment modality, right? I mean, you know, we've been using fasting for ages. Exactly. And yeah. nobody's like, you know, it's not like people did badly. In fact, people used to call it, cleanses, detox. They felt good when they're fasting. They were, you know, empowered. They felt better about themselves. That's what people used to talk about when they're fasting. Now it's like, oh no, you should never fast. Make sure you have a granola bar. It's like, yes, all that extra sugar will do you much good for weight loss. Yeah. Right. It's like, where do people come up with these ideas? It's like, uh, it's probably the snack food companies, right? I had probably hit I think I hit close to 360 or 370. I wish I'd started weighing myself when I started the vegan thing and started, I, I didn't really set out to do intermittent fasting. I just said, you know, I'm going to drink coffee as far as I can in the morning and try and just get as far as I can. And then, uh, and water. And then I'm going to like no more pop. I eventually cut out vodka. Um, and uh, I, I'm pretty sure I had hit 370 because I was having problems. I and and so uh, about 350, I got with things to send us a review unit. You know, with things to send us a lot of different review stuff, um, and I got with things to send me one of the really nice uh, uh, weigh machines. So that helped motivate me to to continue losing weight. But I was basically doing what you're talking about, where I was I was just I basically have like a dinner that was a, it wasn't over too much but it was like you know it was a vegan dinner still um does does uh but i i lost i went down to 270 before wow. i started having some issues um and I, I think my issues were is i wasn't keeping my vitamins up i wasn't taking vitamins to maintain stuff and then i started having some other issues that i didn't understand at the time with uh my body just got in its 50s and i was having uh uh, uh humidity dryness issues in the desert and I didn't understand what was going on. I thought it was because of what I was doing and somehow I wasn't making stuff work, but I started really crashing hard. It turns out I needed a humidifier in the house. I, for some reason, I just, I hit my fifties and my body went, fuck you. We want a humidifier. <laughs> um, but I didn't know that at the time I couldn't figure out why I was crashing. And so I, I went off the diet and of course put on some weight, but even then it got me really in tune with, how much sugar and like you say, insulin probably affects me. I mean, if I have a Mountain Dew, I usually have to have like a sugar, a sugar, real sugar Mountain Dew. Yeah. You give me one of those high fructose corn syrup things and my heart will race like a mother. Um, yeah. So a couple of questions for you. Um, and this is jumping back a bit, but I uh, still a question I wanted to run by you. Um, and I just blanked it, so it'll come back. Um, oh, it, so the body always has its own immune system. I've, I've always heard that it's always, it's always killing cancer, but it reaches a point where finally just cancer wins. Is that true? Yeah. So, in fact, there probably is cancer going on all the time. 
but the cancer cells are sort of few and the immune cells are many. So mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. most of the time, they can't, you never know about it because the immune system will wipe it out before it's even, even uh, gotten there. So the, um, what happens over time is that uh, often with age, the immune system sort of goes down. And that's maybe one of the reasons why cancer is such a disease of aging, because <laughs> you see this general diminishing of all systems, but the immune system among them. If you look at immune suppressing drugs, um, you know, because we use immune suppressing drugs for all kinds of autoimmune diseases, they actually raise your risk of cancer significantly. Holy crap. Those, uh, you know, yeah, those autoimmune drugs that we use for lupus and rheumatoid arthritis and all that sort of stuff, they actually are huge, huge risks for cancer. And they're well known. Um, but that's why, because you're dampening the immune system, which is your main sort of anti-cancer defense. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, the, the, the aging is probably the major cause of, of, of that. What I'm going to think of uh, when you were talking about earlier about how our whole body goes, food, you know, the signal goes out when you eat. Um, I'm going to, that really makes an impression. I want to stick that on my mind. Uh, and it, it, I think one thing I'm going to use as a reference point of it is like when I, when I announced that I have the doggy bag of treats for my dogs and how crazy they get. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to start thinking of that in the future. Like when you eat, that's when the body goes, oh, food. <laughs> but no, you're right. I had heard this thing uh, in, in, when I was trying to research lot, weight loss and I was trying to, you know, just trying to understand what the, uh, and I was, I was trying to break down my belief systems too. Cause I started realizing there were certain belief systems I had, you know, like you have to eat three meals a day uh, you can't go to bed hungry or you'll die, you know, all yeah. this sort of crap, like you mentioned. And, uh, um, one of the things I read is that, like you say, back when we were cavemen, you know, we, we had to kind of fatten up a little bit for winter because, you know, food was slimmer. And so our bodies kind of do that naturally. And, uh, you know, they kind of harvest and collect more food so that we can survive the winter with a little more fat they can ride on. But the problem we have now is, you know, we live in climate controlled environments. We don't, we don't have a winter. We're, I, think, I think I heard someone say the quote, we're eating for winter that never comes because you know, our body goes, hey, winter's coming. We got to fatten up a little bit. So we're like, oh, I'll have some extra pie. <laughs> but it never comes because we're 73 degrees, you know, year round yeah. in our climate controlled homes. We don't, we're not sitting around in winter going, I wonder if Smith's is going to have what, you know, unless it's toilet paper, then, you know, that's out of stock sometimes, <laughs> according to the coronavirus. But, uh, um, you, now, what about the quality of what we, there was a comment that you made in, in what you said about how, yeah, I mean, is what is or not the quantity, but the quality of what we eat, or, or quant and quantity. Let's put those together in that question, if we could. Like when we eat the quant, the quantity of what we eat at that one setting. Let's say we eat once a day, but we eat like the buffet at you know Caesar's Palace. Yeah, you just cut out there for a second, but yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Is, uh, I, it's okay. Uh, so I think the quality is very important because the main thing that uh, affects the quality is the processing of the food. So if you look at foods which are natural, like close to the state they exist in nature, our bodies have adapted to them over time, as opposed to foods that, you know, are sort of never existed before. And the classic example of this is butter versus margarine. So in the 1960s, of course, we thought, oh, butter's full of saturated fat. It's so bad for us. It's causing heart disease. You should eat margarine. So we all switched to margarine. Let me guess who came uh, with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The margarine lobby. The margarine was just full of chemical, right? Because it's uh -huh. an artificial butter. So it's full of chemical. And it was cheaper than butter, which is one of the reasons that it was highly promoted during World War II and stuff during butter shortages. But the whole idea was that it turned out that it was highly processed fats. They turned out to be full of trans fats. So in, in now, we, of course, we know that trans fats were causing heart disease. So the very foods that we thought were causing heart disease, <laughs> butter, we told people to, to switch to margarine, which was actually giving them heart attacks, which is like, okay, that's really sad. So by some guesses, there's about 100,000 to 150,000 heart attacks caused by this advice to switch to margarine every year. Like, that's, Holy that's crap. tragic. And I, I grew up right? in that age where they're I like, know, yeah, there's margarine. Butter is bad for you. 
Yeah. So it's, it's, it's this thing where it's like, okay, well, what we thought we could make a better butter than real butter. Like this is the seventies, remember sixties and seventies where we thought artificial formula is better than real breast milk and artificial orange juice is better than orange juice and artificial sugar is better than real sugar. So there was this whole idea that artificial equals good where now we've come back and said, oh yeah, that was a real big mistake because butter wasn't that bad for you. And eggs, the same thing, right? So it's like, okay, well, we've been eating eggs and butter for thousands of years. And then all of a sudden, since 1970, it causes heart attacks. It's like, I don't think so. But you introduce a brand new food like margarine, which is full of chemical additives and all this other stuff. It's like your body has not evolved to handle that kind of crap, right? I call it an edible tub of plastic because it's so artificial. <laughs> There's nothing natural about that margarine. Drinking it's made in a chemical thing. So eat real butter. And if, if you eat real food, you're going to do fine. If you eat processed foods, then you're going to have trouble. And that's true whether you eat processed carbohydrates, processed meats, or processed fats. Because the same thing goes for a lot of these vegetable oils, right? So, you, you know, everybody was sort of down on uh, you know, natural oils like coconut oil, for example, um, and avocados were sort of really bad in the 90s because they're full of fat. And instead, we had vegetable oil. So it's like, okay, you, you know, for corn oil, like, for example, you actually have to process literally tons of corn to get that ball of corn oil because corn is not fatty. It's not oily. So you have to process the hell out of it to get that much oil, as opposed to olive oil, which you take olives, you squish them, and you get oil, right? That's natural, very close to the natural state, as opposed to corn oil. But we said, oh, olive oil is bad for you, and corn oil is good for you. Turns out it's the exact opposite, right? Coconut oil, same thing. Everybody said it's so bad for you, right? It was used to you make popcorn, and it's so bad for you. Now everybody's like, oh, it's a superfood, coconut. You, you should eat more coconut oil. It's like, okay, well, you know, what changed in this whole time is just this realization that eating natural food is probably good for you. So that's the quality of the food. So, you know, the two main things is one is the, what you're eating, the diet. So eat natural foods and two, when to eat is the other thing. So make sure you have both a period of feeding and a period of fasting, right? And that's the whole point of the word breakfast, or in French, it's the word déjeuner. Déjeuner is the verb to fast. So everywhere in la the language, it tells you that you're supposed to be fasting every single day. It's a, it's a cycle, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's supposed to cycle back and forth, not all one and not all the other. If you're out of balance, then you can increase the fasting to sort of get back on track. And everybody says, oh, well, you can't do that forever. It's like, you know, the world record for fasting was 382 days. Right? Serious? Yeah. Did so he have my average, kind of fat on him to live off of? For that <laughs> I think it was 400 something. Yeah. I, used to, I used to joke about how I but could probably go uh, on. It's time. interesting because if you think about the amount of <clears throat> calories that you burn in a day, it's only about a half a pound of fat. That's mm -hmm. it. So if you're 100 pounds overweight, you could fast for 200 days and be fine. Because a pound of fat is roughly 3,500 calories. If you burn about 1,800 a day, you're talking only about a half a pound a day. If you lose more than that, it's mostly water weight. But if you're mm -hmm. looking to do, say, a seven-day fast, and you think, okay, that's great, well, you're going to lose three and a half pounds of fat. You'll lose more than that. You'll lose about six pounds. Probably, you know, some of that is water. And then you'll regain a few so that you'll be at three and a half. But that's it. So if you're, mm -hmm. if you're 100 pounds overweight or 200 pounds overweight, then, you know, that seven days is like spitting in the wind, right? It's not yeah. very much. And that's why you can do these, these longer fasts. And people have done it. People have done it all through history. Like, you know, and after you do a few, it's just a matter of uh, trying it and seeing how you feel. A lot of people feel very good about it. I got used to it. And I got used to pushing through when I would feel hungry. I would kind of realize that was more like my brain screwing with me to winter up as opposed to me really being hungry. And then if I started losing energy, uh, I started listening to my body and learning more that sometimes I'm just dehydrated. Like a lot yeah. of people don't understand that, that, that they're, you know, they're dehydrated and you just need to drink some water and, yeah. and, and that will bring your energy level up. I mean, there's sometimes where I could feel just really awful and I'm just like, I need to either eat something or whatever. And then I realize that I'm dehydrated and I'm like, I'll take a couple glasses of water. And like I said, I've got a, I still have a really nice reverse osmosis machine and that makes 
all the difference in the world just being about that quality just great tasting water like if i yeah. go to this if i go take water from the sink I, it feels like i'm drinking out of a soiled toilet it's it's really <laughs> bad and i can see why people don't like it um i've even kind of modified a little bit because i i kind of like sugary drinks and so i modified it now where i take the water and i squirt in a little meal just a little bit just to flavor it take the edge off um but yeah. i can i agree with you i one of the things i started doing was was becoming pure again where uh if i ate sugar like i put sugar in my coffee I wouldn't ever use those, you know, those weird things like the wrap. Yeah. I used to always read the diet, the back of the diet drink, and I'm like, oh, yeah. wait, it's... this stuff calls is rat poison? It's in here. <laughs> and uh I'm not drinking that. I'm not drinking the diet <laughs> stuff. But I can well, tell there's it... this um there's this little yellow packet when I was a little kid. And I think it was, it was sodium cyclamate. And that was banned in the US. So I don't think you had it. But in Canada, we still had it. And I read it. It's like, oh, it causes cancer, this, that. I'm thinking, why is it on my table? <laughs> right? well, not in the where where are you eating it? So you can lose weight. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you get cancer, you're going to lose a lot of weight eventually, technically. Yeah. Um, so, it, so basically what you put in your body is important, uh, the quality. And, and to me, it made sense from everything I read. It's like, hey, your body knows how to deal with sugar. It knows a basic sugar, you know, normal sugar. Uh, I watched a couple different uh, movies, like I think it was Food Incorporated and some different things that talked about the modified genetics we did with uh, corn to create this high fructose corn syrup. Uh, you know, just this crazy, you know, genetically whatever. How do you feel? I, let me ask you that. How do you feel about that GMO stuff, genetically modified food? Is that what do you what do you think about? That? Is that good or uh, bad? Or is that? I think that it's it's an inevitability at this point, unfortunately. So if you look at wheat, for example, so wheat from sort of ancient Egypt is actually very different from the wheat we have today. So in the mm -hmm. 60s, there's the Green Revolution, where I remember there's this time that everybody thought everybody's just going to starve to death. There's this population oh, bomb, yeah. right? And there is yeah. this whole Malthusian sort of we're all doomed sort of thing. But anyway, it turns out that human ingenuity is actually pretty amazing. So they came up with this way to grow wheat so in fact about 99 percent of the wheat is no longer the sort of ancestral type wheat it's mm. either called dwarf or semi-dwarf so dwarf wheat is much shorter the stalk is shorter so that these giant heads of uh, wheat don't flop over right and that's the big problem so wheat is very tall and thin has a little bit of uh, actual stuff you can use Whereas it's genetically modified, and this has been the, since the 60s. It has this huge sort of uh, thing that's all, you know, all uh, wheat. So it's been, it's basically taken over and it's increased crop yields like, you know, three, four times. And that's why we don't have um, a problem with feeding the world is because we increase the crop yield so much. The, the point is that these are genetically modified uh, crops. So wheat is very highly genetically modified compared to what it was before. But 99% of the wheat that's grown is dwarf or semi-dwarf. So you actually, it's going to be really hard to avoid that mm -hmm. at this point. Um, so it's, it, I think it's better if you eat this sort of natural stuff, but it's not always feasible. So I avoid it when I can. Mm -hmm. but it's not always going to be that easy to do that. Let's make some enemies. What do you think about veganism? Does, does veganism, does it matter that much? Or how, what do you feel about that? Um, veganism, I actually have no problem with it. Yeah. The, the point, of, though, is that I think people always have the wrong idea about veganism. That is, there's nothing inherently good about being a vegetable. That is, you can be a vegan, eat French fries, potato chips, and, you know, drink uh, chocolate soda and Coca-Cola all day long. And that's not a healthy diet, but it's purely vegan, right? So chocolate donut, pure vegan. Yeah, it's like, that's not good for you. <laughs> Nobody thinks it's good for you, right? And um, so there's this idea that if you stick to vegetables, you're okay. That's not right. There's good vegetarianism and there's bad vegetarianism. So it's the processing, right? So mm. 
chocolate donuts don't grow on trees. If you're to eat like, you know, just stuff that is in its natural form, you're probably fine. If you're just sticking with beans and sort of sort of thing, that's okay. So I don't think that there's anything wrong with veganism. There are some issues with uh, B12 deficiency, for example, and there are other people that run into protein deficiency. So there are problems, right? So the, the, the simple truth of the matter is that meat, like we're animals. So when we eat animals, we can use, you know, what we put in our mouth, we can use it in a very easy manner, as opposed to plants, which are completely different from us. So we have to, it takes a lot of work to sort of extract what we need and make sure that we uh, get it. And that's why mm. animals, uh, because we're animals, are, is, is just more highly nourishing. So, um, so <laughs> veganism, I, you know, on the one hand, I have no issue with it. You can be very healthy and be a vegan, but you have to still watch yourself very carefully. There's nothing that makes you healthy by being a vegan. Um, it's, it's just, if, if you believe in it because of animal cruelty or whatever, uh, you, you're doing it for, that's great, but don't think that it's a healthy diet just because it's vegan. You mm. still have to have a healthy vegan diet. Um, and, and same goes for any diet, right? And that's the problem is with most veganism is that there's this sort of assumption that once you turn into a vegan, you will automatically be healthy. It's like, no, it's not. It has nothing to do with uh, you know, losing weight or anything like the most fattening foods. If you're to name the most fattening foods, what are they? Well, sugar, it's definitely up there. Probably white bread and white potatoes. Like that's, that's all vegan, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's not uh, that good for you. But on the other hand, uh, if you want to be vegan for, for other reasons or because you like the taste or whatever, I have no problem. You can, you can tweak it in ways that are good, but it's extremely restrictive because now you're taking away a lot of food because you're only eating vegetables, but then you also have to take away all those other foods, which are generally like highly processed. So it's, a, it's an extremely restricted diet. That is, if you start taking away all the French fries and the potato chips and the white bread and the white <laughs> pasta and the donuts and you know, all that stuff, now it's a very restrictive diet and it's very hard to follow, but if you can, that's great for you. you know? What about the volume of, of the meal when you eat it? Is there a certain volume sh you should maintain when you're intermittent fasting? Like, uh, you, the, you know, if I, I mean, if I eat once a day, but I go to the Caesars buffet at the Caesars palace hotel in Vegas, I mean, is that bad? <laughs> <laughs> Again, if you eat natural foods, your body will know when to stop. And that's the whole point. So if you think about uh, natural foods, there are actually a lot of hormones called satiety hormones, which will actually tell us to stop. So you go to the buffet, say you're full and you can't, you know, and then somebody says, hey, have another pork chop. Like you can't do it. You will throw up. And you know, those steak houses that say, oh, eat a 60 ounce steak in an hour, we'll give it to you free. They're not giving away a lot of free steaks. I'll tell you yeah, that. I know. Um, it's because there's very powerful signals to stop eating. And so if you eat protein, for example, it, it activates a hormone called peptide YY, which that tells you to stop eating. If you eat fat, it activates another hormone called cholecystokinin, which tells you to stop. If you eat a lot of bulky foods like beans or something, it'll stretch your stomach and it'll tell you to stop. The problem with most processed foods is that it gets rid of all of these things. So if you look at white bread, for example, um, there's no bulk because you got rid of all the wheat. So you don't activate that. There's no um, protein and there's no uh, fat. So you actually have no satiety signaling at all. And same with sugar, right? So that's why even after you're completely full at the mm. Caesars buffet, you can still have a Coca-Cola because there's nothing in there that's going to make you feel full. You can still put it in. Same with cookies and stuff. You can still keep putting it in. So the point is that if you eat natural foods, you will naturally know when to stop. And that's, that's the power of sort of just going to sort of natural foods because we've evolved to eat these foods. Um, and, and, and it will, you will stop at the proper point um, because your body won't allow you to eat more. It's yeah. only when you start eating these processed, highly processed foods, you know, when you take them out of the natural packaging and stuff like, if you, you know, instead of eating apple, you have apple juice. Well, you lost all the fiber and you lost all the bulk and you lost all the vitamins and everything. So you're going to, you can keep drinking apple juice, no problem. But you can't keep eating apples.
right? So, so that's the, <laughs> that's the point. So if you stick to natural foods, you're going to do okay. If you, uh, if you start eating a lot of the, you know, the processed, um, carbohydrates particularly, cause they're very easy. Um, then, then it, you have this tendency to eat more than, than it's good for you. That makes sense because I was, I was having that problem. You know, I go out to eat all the time, I'm single, you know, so I go out, you know, go to McDonald's, go to, you know, I was eating just junk, 10 to 15 Mountain Dews a day. And I remember there's the one movie with the uh, one guy, I forget his name, the name of the movie, but he eats like McDonald's for 30 days. And he's like, oh, Jesus, yeah. I, I, I eat like McDonald's and I'm still hungry. And it just, because yeah. like you say, he wasn't getting the nutrients, you know, it's just Franken food <laughs> there as the judge called it, uh, Frankenstein food um, at McDonald's where there's just the nutrients aren't there. And that's what I found when I, I, and I think a large part of my weight loss was like you said, going intermittent fasting because I was combining that with the yeah. veganism, but veganism it wasn't so much the veganism as me just going back to pure foods. Like I would just eat vegetables and, 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 and really I, I, I purify my diet to get anything through anything away from anything that was highly chemicalized and, or, you know, fabricated. And that seemed to make a huge difference. Yeah. And this is where fasting is like practical too, because if it's very difficult for you to get out there and get it, well, you don't have to eat. You can just skip breakfast or skip yeah. lunch or even skip a couple days if you need to. And then say, okay, now that I'm home, I have time and I can buy some real food. I'm going to have, you know, this big, you know, vegetable dish or steak or eggs or whatever it is that you feel. But this is real food. This is food that your grandmother would have recognized sort of thing. Not this sort of weird concoction of, uh, chemicals that's all, you know, put together in a bar for you or a drink or some shake or something like that. And it's like, okay, well, I don't know what's in that, but there's a whole lot of chemicals you can't read. Um, so that's where fasting is, is, it's, you know, it's, it's so powerful because it's not really something that you're doing. It's something that you're not doing. So it makes mm -hmm. it all easier for you. It doesn't make it harder. It makes things easier. You just have to get through that hunger part of things. This has been brilliantly insightful. Any, any more we need to know about your book before we go? Any more we need to know about your book before we go, uh, Dr. Fong? Um, no, I think it's coming out in November, and it's uh, basically the continuation of some of these, uh, you know, other, the, the, the obesity code, the, the uh, diabetes code, just talking about a different way of looking at these diseases uh, and something that you can use sort of in your, in your sort of day-to-day -day lives to reduce your risk for these diseases. Awesome sauce. You motivated me to go take a look at uh, intermittent fasting. I might have had some of that B12 collapsing. There's something that went off chemically with me after about six months of being on it. Um, uh, give us your plugs one more time so we can look you up on the interwebs. Yeah, so my website is thefastingmethod.com, and you can find me also. I have a number of YouTube videos, and on Twitter, it's at uh, Dr. Jason Fung. That's uh, Dr. Jason Fung, um, and you can find me there. There you go, guys. So order it up. You may want to learn more. I've experienced this in some different variations of, of formulas that I didn't really, I was just randomly doing. So I can attest to a lot of the stuff that you've spoken to here. And it, it makes logical sense when it comes down to it. Check out uh, his book, The Cancer Code, a revolutionary new understanding of medical mystery, the wellness code. Uh, it's available November 10th, 2020. I'm sure you can pre-order it on all the different formats over there. You can go to Amazon or your local book dealers. Uh, check him out. I really love this discussion and uh, everything else. And uh, you can check out his other books too, The Diabetes Code and The BC Code. Eat, uh, eat better and take better care of yourself and take care, better care of the people around you. I appreciate my audience for tuning in. Be sure to go to thecvpn.com or for your friends, neighbors, relatives, get them to listen to the podcast. If you want to watch the video version of this, you can go to youtube.com forward slash Chris Foss. Uh, you can also join our new uh, book club that we just launched last week. It's paid patreon.com for chess chris foss uh we appreciate my for tuning in and we'll see you guys next time